So she had jumped in her car and he sent her the video of her killing Esther. So this episode opens with the car accident that Angela and Karen got into. Now, if you remember from a previous episode when John first met uh, met Angela, they went out to dinner and she started telling him what well, started. She told him the story of why uh, her daughter wasn't with her and the last time they lived together and told her told him about how she was too drunk to drive home and Karen ended up having to drive and they got into this bad accident. I let my daughter drive me home. There was a lot of ice on the road. We had a tree. And so basically, the opening of this episode showed that uh, showed the the accident and her being put into foster care. Oh come on, baby, sing with me. I can't see how. So present day, um, Emma's back uh, in town, and she returned the cat to the child, <laughs> and of course they were all excited, happy about that. What's wrong? And uh, she spoke with George, uh, Georgia, and she you know agreed to give her some time off because at this point everybody thinks that her you know her grandmother passed away and she's uh, grieving. And she wasn't able to catch up with Tom, but she did leave a note on his car. So she made it home, and of course Rose is there waiting, and. Um, she had to have known that this was going to happen eventually. So, Rose, um, but initially she didn't say anything. Uh, Emma basically said that her grandmother passed away and she just had to go. And of course, Rose was like, well, maybe you're a liar. And she kind of looked at her like, what, well, like maybe she, she knows something. I mean, she does, but she's not saying, but, uh. My grandmother died. I had to go say goodbye. Or maybe you're just a liar. So she ended up going in the house. Uh, Emma ended up going, going in the house. And of course Rose followed. And she ended up giving her this bag of stuff. The little stuff. Candies and key rings. And that kind of stuff that you know people get when they travel. And of course she's pissed. She was like I was ready to leave my whole life behind. You think some candy and keychains are going to make up for make up for that? I was ready to go with you. I was going to leave my family. My home. This town. And uh... Emma ends up saying that, you know, I was grieving and people do weird things when they're grieving. And, you know, then she brought up the conversation they had the night they got high when she said that uh, there are bad things, uh, something bad happened in town and how her mom was just afraid and there are bad people out there. And she brought that up again and she ended up, you know, accusing Emma of being that thing, whatever that, you know, that bad person saying that maybe you're, um, Maybe you're the bad person or the bad thing that's in town. Of course, Emma was like, what are you talking about? You told me my mom was right. That it isn't safe here in St. James. But maybe that's because of you. She was like, uh, maybe I should tell my father that you were the one that broke my nose. And so eventually she sat, you know, sat her down and she told her about Jess and told her that Jess uh, died. And that the uh, group home is covering it up. Jess is dead. So, of course, um, uh, Rose is in shock and she's like, well, how do you know? And, of course, she's telling her that, you know, she saw the body, she saw her dead and, you know, she's trying to get to the bottom of it and she just needs her to trust her. And so, of course, because she still loves, she's in love with Emma, she acquiesces and tell her that she, you know, she trusts her, she believes her. So, while Emma is hugging Rose, she has a flashback of that night that she went out with Teresa. Now, if you remember, the first time we saw Teresa and uh, em, uh, Kim and Emma, well, at that time, Karen, was when she walked into the salon and she wanted a haircut and she wanted to know a good place to, you know, to hang out. And then I want to know the best bar in this town to go get trashed in. <laughs> and so this is a continuation of what they did that night. And so she took her to, I guess, the local bar. They played pool and she was having a good time. Friend tonight. And then um, you saw Karen text uh, Parker saying that I just made a new friend for, for both of us. So Mary's back in the office and Jake came in and he had these flowers. 
and he's trying to figure out well who you know what's going on who will send you flowers and she you know she saying you know she she didn't really know and then she got the card and read it and she saw that it was from john did you make a friend of this phone so she ends up calling john and telling him that she wanted him to stop and uh he was saying that uh, you know after all the work that i've done and you know, he, she's saying that, no, I think that you're trying to drag this out as long as possible because you're enjoying the expense account, the credit card, and the car, and, you know, all of these, you know, benefits. So I feel like you're just trying to drag this out as long as, you, as, long as possible, and I just, you know, want things to end. You like your credit card. You like your car. And you don't want to go back to the grocery store to stock shelves anymore. And... Uh, she ends up threatening him, saying that because uh, during their the conversation they had in the car, he mentioned a woman named uh, Andrea Black, and so she did research on this person and saw that you know there was a recording out there of her talking about Andrea Black talking about her assault. And I'm assuming it's an assault that he was never attached to. Um, so she was telling him how. Uh, he should do the right thing and how uh, by Andrea Black how she how he should turn himself in and, or she will now keep in mind at this point she has no idea that he has this recording of her killing Esther so Emma you know eventually catches up well they t Emma and Tom eventually catch up with each other and she invites him over to paint and so you know they talked a little bit he was asking her you know saying how he, you know he was sorry to hear about her grandmother and he started trying to ask her about her family, but he could see that she really wasn't for that, you know, conversation. But, you know, they, they continue to talk, and you find out that he was married before and got divorced. And um, he was talking about how he married, you know, married, uh, I think her name was Margaret or something. He was in love with her, and she broke his heart. She left, and she took his house. and She married me. Left me. Took my house. She still live in this town? And, of course, uh, um, it was like, does she still live in town? And he said yes. And so I think she said something about beating her up, and of course he had to get chuckle over that. And then she told him that she has a daughter, and um, like their separation was supposed to be temporary, but you know some things happened, and she wasn't able to get her. But you know she's working on getting uh, getting custody of her daughter. I have a daughter, Tom. Beautiful, beautiful little girl. And they, um, they kissed. <laughs> they did. So we flashed to this wedding. This is, well, it's actually the reception at this point. So everybody's getting down and shaking a tail feather. And, you know, one woman walks over to another woman. And she's saying, your brother's here. And so she walked over. And uh, her brother is John. And so by the way, the nervousness that she had, you could tell that the girl, the girl he was talking to, who was a teenager at this point, was, uh, her daughter, his niece, and so, but she didn't, she didn't recognize him, because he had gone away so long, you know, she was still a kid, so she don't even know him, and, uh, but the sister was like, oh, well, you know, your, your, uh, stepfather is over, you know, wanted to talk to you, wanted to dance with you or something, and of course, she was like, he's, you know, he's not my stepdad, and it's one of those situations, so she don't care too much for whoever this guy is that her mom just married, but that's not the point, she just wanted her to go away, so, um, of course, when she did, she's looking at him with her eyes all bugged out because, first of all, he's out of state, which was a violation of his parole. And she's trying to figure out, okay, what, what are you doing here? Hey, sis. Man. What have you done now? So they end up going to um, uh, a separate area, I guess, to, uh, to the bar. And they talked a little bit. And he talked about this job, and so, of course, she started asking him about the job, and he talking about how he's working for this woman, and he was hired to find this other woman, and she basically told him, you need to quit. Like, you, you know, it's not a good idea for you to be around women. No, John, quit the job. Um, he, you know, started talking about how he wanted them to be a family again and how, you know, he missed them and how his niece doesn't even know him. And, of course, and you know, she it broke her heart to say it. But she basically said that you, you're not going to have a relationship with your niece. You're, you're never going to get to know her. You can't be in my daughter's life. Never. And you can see his whole, you know, demeanor changed. And, you know, she basically reiterated that she thinks that he should quit. And even if she was, even if he wasn't her brother, she would be concerned about the woman that, that um, has employed him. 
And she, yeah, she just wanted him to stay away from women. And eventually, you know, they said their goodbyes. And um, she went back to her wedding reception. And uh, he had purchased, the, you know, there at the bar. So he had purchased a drink. And so he gave the man the card. And, of course, the card declined. So now he's upset because Mary canceled the credit card. Cards declined. So we flashed the moose. Uh, <laughs> So we flashed to Mary, and she is a booster for the swim team. Uh, Teresa was a part of the swim team, and you kind of tell that people are kind of antsy around her. It was one of uh, what you know, one of uh, the, her daughter's uh, old teammates um, is very close to breaking her Teresa's record, and you know, but she was kind of awkward. She was it was kind of awkward, and she didn't really want to talk to her. But at the same time, she didn't want to be disrespectful, and she was like, "Oh, well, you know, I have to go." And you know, it was nice talking to you when she's like, you know, trying to, this is uh, Mary, was like, hey, you know, how you doing? It's been a long time. And people just walking on by her. And eventually the coach called her over and um, basically had to tell her that uh, they didn't want her as a member of the booster uh, team anymore. He brought up the video because, of course, that article that Kamala wrote about her, take, you know, using her grief and taking it, something that was private and put, uh, making it public. And, um, a lot of parents feel some kind of way about that. I can't accept your support as a booster anymore. The blog and the mother of that missing girl. And, you know, she was basically trying to brush it off like, oh, you know, even Kamala knows that she kind of blew it out of proportion. He, he basically told her that, no, people see what you did as a lack of self-control. It's what you did. Mary, it shows a lack of and that's concerning and they you know people really just don't want you around their children at you know right now and he's trying to you know be diplomatic about it saying how he understands but they you know they don't want her around and so of course she tried to you know make it seem like you know her her money you know all the money that she's you know donated and all this kind of stuff and how you know the board needs to just you know relax and how this is all going to blow over and he basically said that there was already a vote and you were voted out he was he now he was discreet. He wasn't, you know, trying to make a scene, but he did say, I'm gonna to have to ask you to leave. So of course, she's upset. And as and as she was walking out to her car, John called and because of course he's pissed she canceled the card. And he basically told her that canceling the card was a big mistake. And she basically told him to go to hell. Canceling my card, Mary? That was a bad move. So she jumped in her car. And he sent her the video of her killing Esther. Okay, so while she's watching this video, I was like, I was amazed at how clear that video was on that flip phone. I'm just like, oh, okay. Anyway, so back uh, at Emma's place, Tom is still there and they're talking. And of course, he asked her about the note because remember, he left the note. And uh, she told him that she didn't get the note. Um, and of course she asked him what did it say and he basically said that it um, basically said that I liked it. I was interested in you. You gave my note? No. No, no. What did it say? And then he got concerned. He's like, so if you didn't get it, then what happened to it? Maybe your landlord got it because she'd already complained about how the uh, Pete had, you know, been acting about wanting to know her whereabouts and who she's talking to and, you know, the controlling aspect of it. And she said, no, you know, it's, um... It's, uh, we've talked about it and we've come to an understanding, basically. So, uh, he was about to lean and kiss her and he was trying to figure out like what was going on. Cause you know, he got all those, uh, deer heads and all, you know, all over the place. He was like, I feel like I'm being watched, right? <laughs> so she got to kind of close the curtains and, you know, they you know, started to have them a little situation and, uh, but I mean, he really wasn't far off because then you could you could see in, uh, in in through the glass that Rose was there and she saw them. So of course she wasn't happy about that. So um, as they're getting into their little situation, um, Emma has another flashback, and it's of uh, that night with Teresa. They are now back at Emma and uh, Kit's apartment. And they're getting high. And 
you know, she, uh, Teresa started reading her poem and she started talking to her about how she's surrounded by this energy. I see this energy around you. It could be good, but it could be kind of dark too. And if you remember back um, when uh, Emma was doing the lady's hair, she was like, she could see her aura. I sense other lives. You've been many others before you. So I think that's what kind of put her off now that you, you know, you can make the connection between that's something that Teresa said and it's something that the woman said that kind of was like, she was like, what do you mean? And so Emma ends up asking her um, why she didn't want to go home. And she really didn't say, she didn't really answer the question. And, and then she said, so you want to disappear? And Teresa just shook her head, yes. So we still, at this point, we still don't know why she left home. But based on how her mama con conducts herself, it's, I, I, I'm just going to imagine that it's going it's gonna to go back to her mama. Okay, so after, I'm assuming after they had their little situation, um, she started taking down, uh, Emma started taking down the deer heads, all of the, the taxi, the animals that had been stuffed and mounted, right? And she was like, I want you to be comfortable here. So she was, you know, went to take them down. And as she was looking at one of the deer heads, she saw this needle. And then she went to, because she still had the needle that they that he pulled that Tom pulled out of her her knee and in a jar. And so she compared the two and he was like, Oh, it looks like they're, you know, they're both taxidermy needles. So he's trying to figure out like how did you get a taxidermy needle in your knee? And then she focused in on uh, the taxidermist, and it was his name was Andrew Bellevue. But the way she, you know, she kind of positioned her hand where it could, it spelled Abel. You know a man called Abel. It says Andrew Bellevue. I know. And so she started asking him about somebody named Abel, and he was like, "That looks, that says Andrew Bellevue." Bellevue. But she's like, "I know, uh, but." Maybe it means something else. Um, then she starts asking him about the swamp monster. Now, if you remember when she was talking to Jess, when Jess initially took her to the little uh, her little hideout, she was telling her about the swamp monster and about Abel. And then when she asked her about Abel, she got serious and was like, "Well, um, I can't really, I can't really talk about Abel. I can't talk about Abel." So. Um, she's looking at uh, looking at all of the stuffed animals, and it was all they were all stuffed by this Andrew Bellevue guy. And eventually, uh, she started asking about if there if any girls had gone missing before. And uh, Tom told her, "Well, ten years ago, they found a girl out there. They didn't. He didn't give a name. They just said he they found a girl out there." And she's saying that maybe this at this Andrew Bellevue guy is connected to that. And so she. Um, he ends up telling her that Andrew Bellevue died five years ago. Andrew Bellevue's been dead five years. So now she's like, okay, so what is so, which may, doesn't make any sense because if he was dead, then why was Jess so afraid to talk about him? So obviously after seeing that video, Mary went back to the office and she went in her safe and she's just now sitting there holding her gun, right? Like, what, what you about to do? And so you flash to Tom, and of course Tom is playing the Good Samaritan. He had picked some woman up that was a hitchhiking or something off the side of the road. She could clearly, she was getting some vibes off him. She was like, you know what? You could just drop me off at this gas station up here. And he was like, oh, what kind of uh, knight in shining armor would I be? So he's actually trying to, to convince her that he's going to, he could take her, you know, the, the, wherever she's trying to go. But she was like, oh no, you can just drop me off at the station up here. So then he started having flashes of, I'm assuming is the, uh, on Andrea Black, uh, the woman uh, that she saw the video of, of him basically assaulting her. So he's having these flashes while he's in the car with this woman. And then he eventually says, well, you know, I'm not going to go to the gas station. I changed my mind. And he locked the door. I don't want to go to the gas station anymore. So the next scene is john he's at the train tracks the woman is no longer in the car we have no idea what happened to her but he does have like some strands some hair on him on his clothes and so he created this fire and he's burning you know the clothes that he the suit that he was wearing 
And uh, they flash to Mary, and Mary is calling someone. We realize now it's John, and she's um, trying to smooth him, saying how she was hard on him, and how you know she's sorry. And I think I was unkind before. I was hard on you. Yeah, you made it pretty clear how you feel about me. And he's saying that you know, okay, so you know something, and I know something. So what you know, what do we do? Well, then, well, here we are, huh? Uh, I know something and you know something. And so she basically said she wanted him to stay on. She rehired him. And um, she wanted them to move forward as friends. Now, even though it made her sick to say that, she said that. And so, of course, that made him feel like he was important to her. And, yeah. Friends. As friends. So we flashed to Emma and she went to Andrew Belfield's shop, which of course was locked up because again, he passed away five years ago. So she ends up breaking in and she's looking around and she's, you know, finding these um, taxidermy needles. And all of a sudden this man from out of nowhere is bamming on the door like, what are you doing in there? Hey, what are you doing in there? Right, which obviously scared her. So she's ducking and dodging. But then you see the man who she, who attacked her in the, uh, attacked her in the swamp the guy with the hoodie and he's he's behind another wall but it's kind of the place is kind of falling apart so you can kind of see there are holes in the wall what are you doing so he could see her so the man is banging on the door she's now so she's somehow got out and then you focus on this man this other guy in the hood he i don't know if he, he apparently lives there and they made the point to uh, focus on his phone um, and when it fully charged, the light, the screen lit up and his screensaver is a photo of Jess J and there was another girl in the photo that I couldn't make out. So I'm like, okay, who's this other girl? And was this... No, because they're around the same age. And if he's saying that the girl that the body they found was 10 years ago, I don't know. So John is back to work and trying to find out where Karen is. And so um, when he when he found her at the lake, her window was cracked because the cat was in the car. And he had taken the collar off the cat. And unfortunately, the, the collar had a telephone number on it. So he called the number. And unfortunately, the child in the house answered the phone. And uh, he asked her if this is where, I guess, Miss Kitty, I forget the cat's name, lived. And she said yes. And she's like, are you, uh, you know, the cat's mama? And she, of course, she was like, yes. He said, so where does Miss you know, Kitty live in, in Louisiana? And she told him, um, I don't know if that's the parish. I think have parishes in, in Louisiana. We have, you know, not county. So I'm assuming that's St. James Parish. I, I, I don't know. So now he know where to go. Where in Louisiana does little bitty live? So we go to the Barlow's house and Mary arrives home. Uh, Jake is there and Saul is there. They've ordered uh, dinner. And, and there's a knock at the door. They thought um, Jake went to answer the door thinking I guess it was the, uh, the delivery. But it was actually two FBI agents. So she about to pass out because she think that he just sent this, photo, this video of her and she about to go, to go to the prison house. But unfortunately, they came to tell her that they had found some remains, that someone had found some remains. And, you know, after they investigated, they, you know, recognized this necklace that was present. And, of course, they asked, if, asked her if she could identify the necklace. And she identified it as Teresa's necklace. And it was um, an emotional scene, obviously. So Karen is back, um, not Karen, Emma is back in the shop. She's closing up and she get a phone call from Pete and Pete is telling her that they found some remains in the, not too far from Esther's place and um, it happened right around, you know, the time that everything happened with Parker. And then there's another flashback where it keeps this same flashback she keeps having with her. It's the win it's she's in this winter storm and she's tra traipsing through the woods and she's there's blood on her hands. <laughs> and 
And it seemed like I'm, I'm thinking this may be the same night that she collapsed and Esther took her in and she um, gave birth, but she keeps having the same uh, flashback. And, you know, as she was trying to finish up doing what she was doing, someone knocked on the door. And, of course, she, you know, yelled out that they were closed. And then she could hear the door because apparently they don't lock doors. And he came, the, the person came in and she walked around the corner. And it was John. And he was basically saying, you know, I was hoping to catch you guys before you left. So I guess he was there for a cut. I hope that just catch you. And he, they kind of stood there for a minute staring at each other. And that's pretty much how this episode ends. So, yeah, I'm going to end this here. And I will talk to you guys later.